Magandang gabi po sa lahat ng nakikinig sa atin. Dito lamang sa inyong Radio Migrante sa CHRY 1055 FM, your leading source for diversity. At maaari nyo rin kami pakinggan sa www.rdo.to forward slash CHRY, Belk 5973, Rogers Digital Cable 945 o sa tunein.com sa inyong mga web browsers o sa inyong mga smartphones. At inyo po makakasama ngayong gabi ay ang inyong tagapanglingkod na si Rhea Gamana and Ish Cabanya. Magandang gabi, Ish. May the 4th be with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a new month, May 4th, and we have some exciting new episodes for this month for everyone. And of course, we didn't miss the May 1st special program here at CHRY radio station. We had a whole day of different topics about uh, Labor Day, International Labor Day. Mm-hmm. Bale, naganap siya between 12 to 6 uh, noong Thursday. So, kasama po ang inyong lingkod na sa Radyo Migrante na nakapag-contribute no, doon sa special programming yes. ng May Day special programming dito nga sa CHRY Community Radio. Mm-hmm. Especially that Uh, international labor here in Canada is about uh, us uh, migrants in particular and we contribute a lot to the whole economy of Canada and that's what I believe are we going to talk about tonight right? Yes, so mm-hmm. kung narinig po ninyo for the past uh, few days or I guess for the past a week or so yung naging moratorium na pinalabas ni uh, Employment Minister uh, Jason Kenney na nagpapasabi na may uh, moratorium na Uh-oh. na nakatalaga doon sa Temporary Foreign Workers Program kung saan ang inclusion doon sa moratorium ay yung mga food services workers at yun ang tatalakay natin mamaya kasama si si Ed Husan isa pong organizer at writer and also from the um, Migrant Workers Alliance for Change at si Marco Luciano uh, coordinator ng Migrante Alberta live po sila dito po via phone mm-hmm. patch okay so bago tayo uh, pumalaot sa ating interview news and information please go ahead Ish yeah so for our headlines we have killing of village councilor linked of agrarian dispute church bells ring for GPH and NDFP peace and Obama visit boosts US commitment to Asia's pivot so our first news KMP links killing of village councilor to agrarian dispute Kilosang magbabukid ng Pilipinas or KMP attributed the assassination of village councillor and farmer leader Nemelao Melon Barcia, 54 years old, to a land dispute at Haciendo Dolores in Pampanga. KMP Chairperson Rafael Mariano said Barcia is already the second victim of agrarian-related killings and violence in Hacienda Dolores. Mariano said farmers protesting the move were being harassed by Hacienda Dolores and Ayala land. The former Anak Pawis representative said Congress should investigate the issue. According to him, in quotes, instead of maneuvering to extend the CARP and prolonging the agony of farmers, we challenged the Congressional Oversight Committee on Agrarian Reform, or COCAR, to immediately probe the escalating political and agrarian-related killings and violence in Hacienda Dolores, unquote. Ang susunod po nating walita ay isang uh, audio clip. Ito po ay tungkol sa tinatawag pa rin uh, o panawagan na irisumang peace talks between uh, government of the Philippines at saka ng uh, National Democratic Front of the Philippines. So pakinggan po natin ito. We believe that questing together or working together for peace is the vital role of the church, the government, and the ecumenical movement of today as well. I'm going with a historical uh, review of the GPHNN talks. Alam po nyo that we are already this year, I think, 48 years of, of, uh, of the community insurgency, the longest uh, insurgency in the world uh, today. Uh, Of course, we may disagree me on this, but I say that uh, we've been negotiating for the last 27 years. Over 40 rounds of talks, over five presidencies, and I am the fifth panel chair. We are, uh, we reiterate the call of government that uh, we want, we have not closed the doors to peace. We want identifiable subject matters that we can talk about. And we 
want an immediate effect or result with regards to our public, meaning to say lessening of violence. If we can only talk about lessening of violence, that would already have been a great accomplishment as far as government is concerned. Ito yung update. The third party facilitator, the Royal Norwegian government, proposed informal talks in May. Talks to be held in May, no? Hindi yung proposal itong May lang. They did that in March, proposing it be held in May. Kasi kailangan nila ng three weeks at least eh, to prepare for the venue, for the transportation, and the affairs, etc. Uh, ano ang response ng NGF? Despite all these gross violations of the Bernabeu Peace Agreements, the NGF is still willing to hold informal talks. So, ginawa nila. Sabi ni Secretary Dennis, ayaw na namin kahit ng informal talks kasi pag-uusapan lang yung JASI. Of course, NGF will bring it up because NGF thinks it's important. Pero sinasabi pa ng NGF na yun lang ang pag-uusapan, hindi. Kasi pwede pag-uusapan yung special trial. In addition, sa huling, pinakahuling statement ni Louis Halandoni, dated April 8 or April 10, sinabi niya na meron silang pinupost na doable, sinasabi doable, peace issues. Uh, in response to yung sabi ni Secretary Gerez at ang binanggit ni Alex na kailangan doable at kami time-bound. Okay, that's it. Din ang nanunumpang. Three months. Three months to discuss rehabilitation of Yolanda because it's urgent. Three months to discuss uh, yung anong nagawin sa land reform kasi di ba mag-expire na yung, no? yung law. Ano na mangyayari dun sa mga kailangan ng land reform pa. So, as far as the NGF is concerned, hope for the best. That's what the NGF is doing, hoping for the best, but at the same time, preparing or expecting the best. Last message, tingin namin, ang tingin ng NGF, mas mabilis na mababalik yung resumption ng talks, yung whether informal or formal, kung mapalakas natin yung feeling natin, yung process natin yung sarili natin mga panawagan mula sa mga churches, mula sa communities, mula sa schools na gusto natin maibalik yung usapan ng pangkapal na. Sige natin ang standing ovation na For our third news, Obama visit boosts U.S. commitment to Asia pivot. U.S. President Barack Obama's four-nation tour of Asia, which concluded earlier this week, was all about demonstrating his commitment to a signature U.S. foreign policy, the Asia's quote-unquote pivot. Doing so required Mr. Obama to walk a tricky diplomatic tightrope, reassuring U.S. allies that Washington was intent on its strategic shift to Asia, seen as a counterbalance to China's rising influence without provoking Beijing. On most fronts, political analysts say Mr. Obama accomplished the balancing act with grace. The pivot, also known as the strategic rebalance, was launched in late 2011 as a way of refocusing American foreign policy on the Asia-Pacific region after a decade in which Afghanistan and the Middle East had monopolized the White House's attention. Territorial disputes involving China and its neighbors have given the security dimension a higher profile than its economic and political planks. As a result, some in the Philippines said they were disappointed by Obama's failure to state explicitly that the U.S. would fight alongside Manila in any future conflict with China over disputed territories in the South China Sea. So that's all our news for this episode of May 4th. But we still have another discussion, the the featured interview tonight, which is about the moratorium on the Temporary Foreign Workers Program. So with us is uh, Syed Hassan. He is a writer and um, organizer in Toronto and also um, working at the uh, Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. And Marco is here. So hello, Hassan. And Mr. Luciano, hello. Hi. Uh, hello. Hello. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you. So, Hassan and um, Marco, thank you so much for giving us that opportunity for, for us to interview you once again here at Radio Migrantes. Let's start with the term moratorium because a lot of people pretty much don't know what this term is. What exactly is moratorium? Maybe Hassan can uh, start up with this discussion. So, obviously, we all know that the conservative government has responded to a wave of media 
that's uh, happened in the last two weeks or last three weeks um, that has been very anti-immigrant, anti-foreign work, um, particularly around three or four stories of so-called Canadian citizens losing their jobs because of um, migrant workers. And as a result, in sort of a knee-jerk attempt, the Conservative Minister of Employment put a ban. So he said that there will be no new labor market opinions issued. Um, so that means suspending all pending and new labor market opinions in the food sector on, um, for specific occupations in the food sector across the country. Mm-hmm. Um, so the moratorium is essentially he's saying that for now, there'll be no new um, LMOs issued. We've also heard that perhaps work permits are not being processed, but that to this date remains a rumor. Perhaps Marco knows more about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, go ahead, Queen uh, Marco. Um, yeah, you know, um, I mean, the, what Hassan has said is, is pretty much um, it. Um, and and I think, you know, it is, uh, they, they put this moratorium at the context that, quote unquote, there is a uh, violator's employer that violates uh, the temporary foreign worker program, right? And they want to, quote unquote, investigate it. Uh, but the problem with the moratorium is it's a one. It's it's a blanket moratorium where you know it's not really it's not really the employer who are being affected uh, more uh, than the the workers themselves. And um, and currently in, in Alberta, uh, just in Alberta, there's there's a lot of uh, folks uh, that are uh, that we met yesterday actually that, that are affected and will be affected really really soon. Mm-hmm. And when is the effectivity of the federal moratorium, and how long? Well, uh, the, the moratorium was imposed on April twenty fourth, um, uh, with no, with very indefinite uh, timeline. So it could it could be until tomorrow. It could be until next year. We don't know, and and that that is the problem with this moratorium. And also, the moratorium is extremely unclear. So they issued a press release, right? and they're actually using different classification systems. So it's not very clear, for example, <clears throat> if they're talking about the food sector, does it include restaurants inside hotels? In some cases, they don't, but if the restaurants are franchise within the hotel, then it does, because a hotel is accommodation. Um, similarly, um, there are specific occupation classes, so cashiers, cleaners, um, managers, um, executive chefs, so all kinds of people who might be related to the food industry are banned, mm-hmm. but not all of them. So this isn't a thought through in any way response. What has happened is there's been a wave of xenophobia and anti-immigrant racism that's been fanned largely by the media. So, you know, an extremely unjust program, which is the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, which comes from a long history of immigration changes right? Um, we have to go back at least to, you know, the beginning of these programs in 1974 to understand how it's come to be, mm-hmm. simplified to this very simple message, the foreigners are taking our jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and in doing so, this modern term has been created. It's just not been thought through. Um, and, you know, it doesn't make sense either economically, it doesn't make sense politically. Mm-hmm. And the minister who imposed this is former immigration minister Jason Kenney. Uh, what do you think is his gain on on imposing or implementing this kind of uh, moratorium on the temporary foreign worker program, which he, he himself was instrumental in in implementation of it? Well, I, I think. Well, first of all, Jason Kenney, uh, during his stint uh, as the CIC minister, is, it, 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 I, I feel that he's the, the most brutal um, uh, immigration minister that really intensify, you know, temporary migration, right, at the at, at the expense or uh, in the name of profit. Secondly, I, I think his gain. I, it's really uh, how I how I feel is that he's he's pretty much washing his hands. He's pretty much washing his hands in terms of what's going on, what came out of, of this media blitz. You know, um, I think Hassan was talking about how media played into it. And I think when uh, folks start picking up on it, you know, it, it's a way of, of Kenny sort of washing his hands in terms of the, the, the mess that this government created, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, just to add to what Marcus said is that the conservatives were locked into a specific struggle, right? So at one point they had to 
um, respond to the interests of the business lobby, the you know the capitalist class or whatever the one percent. However, we understand people who profit from the displacement of people and you know our work, um, who wanted people who not just could be paid less because in many cases that's not the case but more and more people who could be controlled, people who would be scared because they didn't have full immigration status, because that's what central is, right? Lack of immigration status creating core stability. Um, and on the other hand, the sort of wave of xenophobia and, you know, nationalist fervor, because people are saying, oh, these foreigners are taking our jobs. Now, I think first we should address that you can't, you know, the economy includes migrant workers. Migrant workers live here, they work here, they pay taxes. Um, so when you talk about the Canadian economy, it actually includes migrant workers. So you can't say the Canadian and the foreigner, because people are living in the same place, acting in the same place, interacting in the same place. So that division is purely about xenophobia and racism. So the Conservatives were in this bind where they had to somehow respond to, you know, not lose out on the social Conservatives, who are the people who are essentially racist, or the economic conservatives who are people who want access to cheaper and cheaper labor. And I think that Kenny trying to do damage control. So he saw this huge wave um, of um, media hurting the conservative brand, and he responded to show that they would take tough action. And um, this was the thing that they came up with. And, um, and I think that the fallout has been interesting. So, actually, the Food and Restaurant Association, the Canada Food Industry mm-hmm. lobbies are all actually fighting and arguing for the moratorium to be lifted. Mm-hmm. And having we are, so we're weirdly very, very different reasons, obviously. But the, um, I think migrant justice activists and employers are somehow, at you know, seeing somewhat, very, very slightly, mm-hmm. both calling for the moratorium to be lifted, while mm-hmm. the rest of the population in the electoral vote is happy that the government is taking some action. So it's quite a confusing um, state of affairs right now. Mm -hmm. And thank you for naming that it's quite confusing because we get a lot of different reactions from people. And there was an earlier interview with McDonald's Canada CEO John Betts uh, and he went on all out attack against the workers program and this is just a, a part of that interview calling the workers program as BS. And the fact of the matter is we're a big bad company corporate you know bad company and these poor maligned employees uh, you know are who they are. Yes they are disenfranchised some of them don't work for us anymore but you know what the, in the scheme of things it doesn't matter. Here's the kicker. This has been an attack on our brand. This has been an attack on our system. This is an attack on our people. It's okay. I, I said I used those words when I described uh, my conversation with uh, the minister last week. He gets it. That's an interesting point coming from the big boss of McDonald's Canada. How do you unpack this clip? Uh, maybe from Marco. Well, you know, at, at that same clip, he, he was just, um, you know, brown nosing, right? I mean, talk about how uh, him and Jason Kenny was thought, you know, how Jason Kenny understood them. Um, um, and, and I think I think he was talking about you know when you mentioned temporary foreign worker program. I don't think he's talking about the program. Mm-hmm. At BS, I think he's talking about the the workers mm-hmm. uh, that, that's actually you know um, talking against this, this program. And, and I think it's just uh, you know uh, reiterating that one the, the program quote unquote works for them. Right? I, it's simple as that for me anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, any reactions from Hassan? I think when he talks about the poor disenfranchised workers, he's actually talking about the few white Canadians we saw in the media. And I think so he's talking about the big bad employers and the disenfranchised, but nowhere in there do we actually hear about the voices of migrant workers. Even in his head, those are the two sides, mm-hmm. right? And, and then he says the real issue is that our brand is being hurt, and that's bullshit, as he put it. So I think that... So, I mean, I don't know. At least I don't, and, I, and I've see, heard this interview before, mm-hmm. and I think that he's actually parroting the same thing that's been happening in large part in the media, that the story is about um, the employers, the big bad employers, that people are actually really angry about, um, versus the poor Canadian citizens. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the baseline of where the debate is. And then on top of it, perhaps some people who are slightly more progressive are saying, and 
the temporary foreign worker program is bad, it's mm-hmm. abusive, it's exploitative, but the solution that both those arguments come up with is the same. That is the exclusion of migrant workers themselves. I'll just Point put you on hold on, on that. I just have a, another question because there were some activities during the May 1st and the people responded with a strong uh, and solid to not support this moratorium because th- there's so many implications on the working people, especially the migrants. And we've read some of the statements that were released during the International Labor Day and the general call is uh, to support and not deport uh, migrant workers. Can you explain that to us, uh, Hassan, again? Okay. Right. So maybe I'll start where the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change position is and then the Labor Day actions that took place. So so coming in, starting at the beginning of this week, um, we saw that in large, because the moratorium happened last Thursday, and the beginning of the last week, you know, statements were being issued by Justice for Migrant Workers. We in the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change said that the moratorium should not include in-country and pending applications. So any application in the country are pending. And we asked for a just transition into a permanent immigration system. Um, and so and then we were doing a lot of media work trying to change the channel. So you have to understand at this point, many unions, many progressive organizations, the NDP are actually not just celebrating the moratorium, but actually calling for its expansion. So then the tide begins to turn Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, Migrant are doing really good work um, um, in terms of media, changing the channel, like bringing up workers' voices who've been impacted um, by this and sort of su- highlighting it. And then on Thursday, International Workers' Day, we saw a series of statements saying that these actions actually result in mass exclusion, mass deportation. So the no one is legal Toronto statement called the support to report the Migrant May 1st statement that came out. And both sort of, you know, similarly pointing out that we're talking about workers' rights, we need to talk about all of the working class. And I think particularly that's calling out the labor movement, which particularly the BC Fed, the Alberta Fed, the CLC, um, had, you know, at best a mixed message around the moratorium. Um, Mm -hmm. So, as I said, simultaneously talking about the abuse of the program, but in some ways using the abuse of the migrant workers as the excuse to exclude them. So, Mm -hmm. I think the debate has continued to shift. Um, over the last few days, I mean, yes, the NDP is critic Jenny Sims, who until now has been very um, outspoken, uh, calling for the expansion of the moratorium um, and a full stay of the program and then an investigation, actually came out. Um, perhaps Mugante, um sorry, Marco knows more, um, and kind of reversed her tune at least at one press conference. Mm-hmm. The comments inside Parliament and the press statements the NDP has made have not changed. So really, we're going to see tomorrow whether the dialogue shifts from sort of blaming and using migrant worker exploitation as an excuse to deport, essentially, has shifted. So, um, But the message, I think the channel has finally begun to change this week, um, whereas in the last three weeks, we have um, just really seen the same kind of like the perverse, disgusting, vitriolic pitting of um, people at the bottom of the barrel. Mm-hmm. unemployed workers against migrant workers mm-hmm. Hassan thank you thank you so much I, I know you you need to go um, unfortunately but um, I hope we'll have you again thank you so much thank you for having me and thanks Micro- uh, Marco see you soon Kuya Marco so um, any reaction po uh, doon sa implications yes. of, of the of the moratorium on migrant workers well I, I think there's a couple of uh, things that we need to look at right uh, first is the the migrant worker aspect and we, we, we talk about the temporary foreign workers we're talking about the temporary workers under the NOC classification DNC which is the low skilled mm-hmm. um, the, the general uh, message is that it seems that all temporary foreign workers workers have no access to permanent residency that's not true all the skilled worker under classification A and B uh, have access to permanent residency, right? Um, so when we talk about temporary foreign workers, just want to make sure that we're talking about classification TMD, which is uh, the low skilled workforce, and they are the ones being affected totally by this by this moratorium. Yesterday, there are already a couple of people in my house that were uh, that were dismissed by their employers because they cannot they were not able to renew the work permit. They got a, a letter from uh, CIC that it's not going to be renewed. And the fact that that happens, it, it, you know, they, we're seeing more and more that will happen. Another 
uh, thing that I found out yesterday is one of the friends of the person affected went on vacation to the Philippines and when he was at the airport, he wasn't allowed in because he's an in, under implied status, which is he was basically waiting for uh, his work permit to arrive. And since it was frozen uh, or the moratorium happens, he was sent back home to the Philippines. We're trying to contact that person in the Philippines uh, as we you know, talk. Mm-hmm. Which is a good segue because uh, our next question is what about those applications which are still in process, especially the ones who have paid already for to their agents and recruiters f- from the okay. Philippines? Well, uh, so if 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 uh, you are your application is pending, definitely that's you know that's covered um, that's covered under the moratorium. So anything that is outside uh, or not yet uh, haven't gotten their work permit or LMO, uh, whether they're in the country or outside the country, uh, are already affected by the moratorium. Mm-hmm. Kuya Marco, merong tinweet dito one one of our uh, friends who's listening today, a uh, business person na ang sabi niya na because of the ban on temporary foreign workers, all our efforts and large amounts of money have been wasted. The future and livelihood of not only our company but also those Canadians who we employ has been jeopardized. Any reaction doon sa statement na yun kasi it's a big uh, impact no uh, doon sa mga employers na who actually provide work naman na na decent work and then yet kapag nawala nga itong or the more time will imply na ito na nga uh, hindi na nga makakapasok yung mga food service workers what do you think of this well you know the business people have different angles on why they want the moratorium uh, you know revoked right um and I think it's pretty much uh, what they want is an access to temporary foreign workers. Uh, businesses can continue um, even if there's a moratorium. So uh, I think in response to that tweet, um, it will be their their income would be affected. Their businesses, you know, you know what? There there are Canadians who who can work there, right? But but these businesses have different intention in terms of uh, the temporary foreign worker program in the moratorium. And I think Hassan was talking about that mm-hmm. earlier, that there's two, you know, there seems to be two messages going out uh, regarding the, you know, the, the retractment of this uh, moratorium. And definitely, you know, um, businesses is not, you know, calling for the interest of the temporary foreign workers, but rather, you know, their own interest and their profit margins. Magkakaroon din ba ng investigation on the side of the employers as well, hindi lang doon sa mga employees? Kasi just to, you know, to be fair, siguro kasi we we all heard about, you know, how temporary foreign workers have been, you know, abused in all kinds of uh, um, um, unfortunate circumstances. But in this case, na natatag na yung moratorium, magkakaroon din po ba ng investigation? What do you think? Um, I think siguro, ano, no, ulitin ko yung uh, napag-usapan kanina, it was, it was brought up earlier na yung moratorium was imposed because of the so-called uh, bad employers that violate the program. So the investigation really, uh, or technically, is towards the employer, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. the so-called investigation is para sa employer. Pero um, ang problema doon is that hindi yung employer yung uh, ano yun, nasasaktan, kundi yung employee nila, particularly the temporary foreign workers. Uh, kasi doon sa, naka, dahil nakabata ito, doon sa LMO at work permit, lalo na kung mga mag expire ng uh, LMO and work permit or yung expired na ng LMO and work permits. No? So definitely, it is not, hindi iimbisagahan ng employees, it is the employer that will get investigated, quote-unquote, but it ang naapektuhan nito is hindi yung employer you know yung employee mm-hmm. ang mas na, mas naapektuhan nito at uh, hindi lamang yung paparating pa lang dito kundi mas yung nandito na no uh, sa Canada na na mag-expire na uh, nag-expire na or uh, maghihintay na lang itong mga work permit at LMO kaya nga ang panawagan natin is hindi you know uh, Aside from pu- uh, pulling the LMO, kung hindi kagad ito mapupull out, uh, yung, L- yung, yung, uh, yung moratorium, i-exempt man lang yung mga nandito na sa Canada. No? Kasi um, either ang consequences niyan, uh, magkakaroon niya ng mass deportation. No? Ikalawa, yung mga naka-pending yung kanilang nominee program uh, for permanent resident na dahil wala silang work permit, mababaliwala yun, no? yung, yung mga resident 
uh, permanent resident application. Ikatlo, uh, malamang lumaki ang ating undocumented workers. Dahil alam naman natin na hindi Uh, marami sa atin ang baka hindi na umuwi dahil sa kahirapan ng buhay sa Pilipinas. Malamang kailangan nila magbayad ng utang sa Pilipinas aside from uh, making sure they, they are sending uh, money uh, for their families back home. Mm-hmm. And given all these points that you mentioned, big big things that we will be expecting, I guess, until next year and the coming years, uh, how are we preparing and uh, how are we uh, organizing people to be informed about this situation uh-huh. that's coming. I, I think y- yung uh, yung strategy ngayon is ano na no I mean narinig niyo naman yung uh, binanggit ni Husan kanina. Mm-hmm. Hindi, hindi na lang to isa-isa eh. you you're, you're it's not servicing anymore helping you know one migrant worker in need of an LMO etc but it shifted to a political discussion it's a political campaign therefore yung tugon din ng mga organisasyon uh, mag- magmula diyan sa Toronto hanggang sa BC political din ano so hindi mm-hmm. ang ibig sabihin nito pagmomobilisa you know pag-aaral pag-educate at, at mobilization una pag-aaral ano ba talaga ang consequences nitong moratorium na to ikalawa uh, ano ba tal- talaga ng temporary foreign worker program at hindi lang ito uh, a Canadian guest worker program you know this is part of a global global program um, to address a- and answer the neoliberal agenda of uh, the Canadian government. No? Mm-hmm. So, ikatlo, siyempre pagpapakilo sa mga tao. Uh, ang importante dito is marinig yung mga storya ng mga tao. Marinig yung boses ng mga ng migranteng masa. Uh, ay, ayun yung importanteng marinig eh, ng, ng mga kanadyanong masa. Mm-hmm. At para magtug, mag, magtugma yung ano nila, yung, yung, yung mga panawagan. Ang panawagan ng, ng uring manggagawa dito sa Canada is ano, uh, you know wage rights and livelihood for 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 us Canadians but also this is the call of of migrant workers uh plus status right mm-hmm. um so importante na na lumabas itong dalawang uh, dalawang sektor ng masa natin ano na uh, at magtulungan sila para i-address yung issue hindi lamang ng moratorium kundi mismo yung issue ng temporary foreign worker program at yung issue ng unemployment dito man o sa Pilipinas Mm-hmm. Uh, may comment lang po si Kuya Louie. Ang sabi niya, kung bad employers yan, tingin nyo ba may ugnay din ito sa issue ng human trafficking na tinututukan ngayon? Well, you know, sa, sa Canada, uh, iba't ibang definition ng human trafficking. Ano? Um, uh, meron yung sex trafficking, uh, etc. Et Pero definitely, uh, the general definition of trafficking, uh, pag dinala mo ang isang tao uh, beyond the borders at uh, through uh, coercion uh, so pagdating dito hindi nila alam na wala pa lang trabaho uh, it's a, it's a form of trafficking and and yes i, I agree na you know isa tong anyo ng trafficking ng global trafficking na hindi lamang nangyayari dito no uh, nangyayari dito sa iba't ibang bansa uh, na ngayon uh, hindi na lamang ang pinitrade ngayon hindi na lamang yung mga raw materials na ang pinag-e-exchange sa global market kundi tao Uh, there's, a, there's a global uh, buying and selling of people. Mm-hmm. Final message, uh, Marco Luciano, sa mga nakikinig ngayon sa Radio Migrante. Final, well, um, one, I think uh, we have uh, an urgent call sa lahat ng komunidad, uh, sa Filipino community and other ethnic uh, communities that affected by the moratorium. Ang importante po is lumabas tayo, magpa-interview tayo sa radyo, Uh, magsulat tayo, mag- manawagan tayo sa mga kaibigan natin uh, na itong moratorium na to is, is, is i-pull out. No? Uh, ikalawa, kailangan talaga nating uh, questionin as, as a community uh, itong temporary foreign worker program. No? Uh, at patuloy tayong lumabas at uh, uh, you know, i- i- marinig yung ating mga boses uh, sa anumang anyo. No? Uh, at supportahan itong mga organisasyon sa Toronto, yung, yung MWAC sa Toronto at, at yung migrante Canada na ngayon ay nagmobul, nagmobilisa against this moratorium and also the temporary foreign worker program. We're calling on permanent residency now. Uh, not even a pass to uh, permanent residency but uh, we want permanent residency now or upon arrival. Maraming salamat Marco Luciano, Coordinator of Migrante Alberta. Salamat po. Walang ano man, maraming salamat din sa inyo at uh, kumusta sa lahat. At yun po, si uh, Marco Luciano, coordinator ng Migrante Alberta. So ish, uh, uh-huh. wow, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a heavy topic I would say. Uh, uh-huh. um, nakaka-ano lang, nakaka- 
I don't say it's 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 very dis uh, dismaying, no? You know, when when you hear both sides of the story, nakaka ano talaga? Nakaka panghinayang na meron pa palang ganito, ganitong mga issue na talaga nga uh, it 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 hurts uh, both sides. Pero what do you think you as you know, you you worked for a while? I'm still working. Yeah, know? well, I mean, you work for a while in. But, but uh, let, let's go back to the to the general question. Yeah. Will this benefit or devastate mm. migrant workers? And we have some interesting uh, unpacking of that general question because it was mentioned earlier. How do we define migrant workers? What kind of migrant workers? And also, uh, what's the context of this migration in general? Why people leave their home countries to get jobs to survive basically to to get access to services and uh, and it's so problematic here in Canada still because mm-hmm. even though migrant workers work and pay taxes they cannot access benefits in mm-hmm. general mm-hmm. so um in essence the FWP uh, moratorium is not beneficial for for the migrant workers mm-hmm. uh, especially the low skilled uh, what according to the those classifications mm-hmm. so this is an ongoing conversation it's interesting that there are some people who commented online and uh, mm-hmm. tweeted us mm-hmm. um, and it's still an ongoing uh, conversation until the next year mm-hmm. when deportations may uh, yeah. happen mm-hmm. so uh, I think uh, engagement is the key and communication and organizing the community mm-hmm. uh, in general to speak out and voice out their their positions on this issue. Mm-mm. So, aantambayanan po ng radio migrante o susubaybayan itong uh, issue ng uh, Temporary Foreign Workers Program Moratorium na pinalabas ni uh, Employment Minister Jason Kenny nung nakaaraan lamang. And we're going on to Pulso ng Migrante. So, we went out to interview Rafael Fabregas and he's running or his campaign is to be nominated uh, as MP. Magandang gabi po at uh, ito muli si Rayan mula sa Radio Migrante sa CHY 1055 FM your leading source for diversity. Muli po nandito tayo sa Cordillera Day at may panauhin po ako ngayong gabi na siya na po mismo ang magpapakilala sa inyong lahat. First of all, I want to wish everyone a happy Cordillera Day. Ako si Rafi Fabregas, or Rafael Fabregas, and um, isa po akong abogado dito sa Toronto, specializing in Canadian immigration law, including citizenship and uh, refugee law. I've been uh, a lawyer for the past eight and a half years, and I enjoy what I do, what I do as a lawyer. Ano po ang Mayo Uno? Tanong ko po sa inyo, ano po ang kahulugan sa inyo ng Mayo Uno? Well, it so happens that May 1st, first and foremost... <laughs> is the birthday of one of my aunts, uh, Tita Ninita, who's uh, Bicolano. So, um, on May 1st, the first thing I do is send her a text or give her a call, and uh, she's the sister of my father. Tita Nitz, mag- makikibati na lang ako in advance. Happy birthday. <laughs> but May 1st is also significant uh, because um, it is International Labor Day. It is a day that I recognize, even uh, as I had been growing up in the Philippines and going to school there, seeing every year the uh, the groups and the unions that come together on that day to celebrate, to to pronounce their their beliefs and their strengths in in unions, in in workers' rights and uh, fairness and things that they so May 1 is significant because we should always remember that, for instance, Canada. Canada cannot function without, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears of the people that work to make this country function. And I, I absolutely recognize that and I fully respect um, every individual. Because we are all workers in one way or another. And um, I recognize that and I also recognize the, the benefits that unions do provide to making sure that workers um, who are protected by uh, union based laws and in unions in general um, are extended the just and fairness that they truly deserve. Yung issue tungkol sa inaagaw raw ng mga migrant workers at mga immigrants yung trabaho na para 
sana sa mga Canadians. Any reaction to that po? Yeah, first of all, I want to give a message to the unions out there. Just let them under, I just want them to understand that when, when they go out and say, you know, these things, they have to remember that they're also talking about workers. Uh, whatever their nationality, whatever their background, they still are workers at the end of the day. And they're still doing the same thing uh, as the Canadians, uh, which is to work hard to support their families. So that's, that's one message that I'd like you know, everyone to understand not just the unions, that these workers, that these people are still workers and they're doing the same thing. Now, they just happen to come from another country. Now, that aside, medyo ano lang yun, ano? parang editorial lang. But that aside, I'm not convinced that there's any truth to that. I see so many, uh, I see so much politics driven into that message and, you know, the danger to, to listening to that message, and we've seen this in the current government, is that over the past few years, things of this nature uh, come up in the media, and in response to this, the government implements laws that don't benefit or don't address the, you know, the quote-unquote evil that these scandals um, seem to address. But rather, uh, they only make it harder for the people that we seek to protect, for the people whose lives we seek to make better. The consequence is that, you know, the laws that are implemented by this government only do the complete opposite. I'll give you a very, very good example. Naging scandal many years ago yung yung mga caregivers na inabuse daw ng mga employers and so that became sort of the the flashpoint for fighting for living caregiver program reform but instead of fundamentally instead of addressing the fundamental issues in the live-in caregiver program they did a patchwork of changes where in the end the result is simply this in 2008 there were approximately 15,000 live-in caregivers admitted to Canada under the live-in caregiver program in 2013 years after they made changes to the live-in caregiver program that number has dropped to about 2,000 per year so tell me did those changes fix the program no they just made it harder to use the program to take advantage of it uh, for Canadian citizens who require live-in caregivers uh, who, whose needs are not being met. They've just made it much more complicated, much more expensive, uh, less simple to bring in live-in caregivers. So when it comes to these things, these scandals, let's not, you know, let's not give our knee-jerk reactions to, to these things, but let's actually think about what exactly is, is the issue here. Now remember, this current scandal about the workers from McDonald's jobs from Canadians remember that the the franchise that uh, hired these these workers went through a federal government program to establish that there are no Canadians or permanent residents who can full you know who can fill these positions these these rules were made by the federal government and the federal government is turning around and say that people are abusing the temporary foreign worker program but they still don't show evidence of the abuse they, they it seems to me that the only evidence out there is that the employers followed the rules and if if uh, those rules are not government, then perhaps it's the rules that we should target, not the employers and most definitely not the temporary foreign workers that, you know, that are innocent here. They're, they're called to come to Canada and they came. So that, that's my view on the, uh, on the whole issue. Medyo mahaba, no? Okay lang po yun. <laughs> Mike Ling Bensay, para sa mga kababayan natin, nakikindig ngayon sa Radio Migrante. Lalong lalo na sa mga migranteng uh, workers, Jan. Kayo ang, you know, you you are the true heroes of the Philippines. Uh, you are the ones who go out there and sacrifice day in and day out, and not just from working day in and day out, but also from being away from your families for not just you know a week or two weeks, but in many years for many years being apart, and that that has a cost 
to your family. Um, but because of the conditions in the Philippines of high unemployment, high underemployment, very low wages, uh, high poverty, uh, things of that nature, you're forced to have to leave your the comforts of your home uh, just to be able to make sure that your children have something to eat and that they have a decent life. So I congratulate all of you. Uh, I'm with you every day as you toil and I, I fully support you and uh, I hope that one day you know I can I can show you that I can show you how how supportive I am of your cause I believe in you mabuhay kayong lahat and keep up the good work you make the Philippines proud you definitely make me proud by your hard work and uh, and your hope maraming salamat attorney Rafael Papagas so that was your pulso ng migrante segment for this week now it's time for your community listings just quickly uh, learn about history of the Filipino community in Toronto through the histories of culture, family, and work. Hear how making it a life in St. Jamestown helped this community make its mark in Toronto. This is a, a heritage walk tour uh, next week, uh, May 11th, uh, led by Diana Marie Roldan, and it's approxim- approximately one and a half hours. Average walk is on pavement, so this will happen again on Saturday, May 31st, 10 a.m., both of them. Another thing is Labor Plus Love, a celebration of caregivers, features storytelling, spoken word, and musical performances by various artists, of Filipinos, and Canadian. So, Kwentong Bayan, in collaboration with CCSO, Caregiver Connections, will present stories from their comic book combined with live illustration and audio soundscapes. That's happening on May 11th, Sunday, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. at Beat Zatun, 612 Markham Street. Uh, this will be posted on Radio Migrante page as well as this one call for submissions Toronto-based literary collective Akdaan is calling for writers of Filipino descent in Canada and the United States from various migrant workers communities to submit their your work your art works and literary works under the theme of migration and migrant labor. Works will be published in December of this year. Please email your entries on an email that will be posted on the Radio Migrante Facebook page as well or you can visit their own page fb.com forward slash akdaanto or a-k-d-a-a-n-t-o Press Freedom Day 2014 Ethnic Press uh, Exhibition Tomorrow, more than 60 VIPs confirmed to attend the opening ceremonies with guest speaker the Honorable Kathleen Nguyen Premier of Ontario uh, and some other VIPs as well This is Organized by the National Ethnic Press and Media Council of Canada or NEPMCC, exhibit opens Monday tomorrow, 5 p.m. at the Rotonda of the Toronto City Hall. At yun po, dito po, nagtatapos ang ating programa sa Radio Migrante sa CHOY 105.5 FM, your leading source for diversity. Okay, magandang gabi po sa inyo and uh, we'll hear from you next week.